Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the All Things Interesting podcast. On today's episode, I am joined by marriage researcher and educator Nate Bagley, whose mission is to rid the world of Medicore love. In 2012, Nate did a cross-country road trip where he interviewed the country's most madly in love couples and renowned relationship experts to discover the secrets of truly epic, lasting love. Over the course of the show, we talk about Nate's journey, interviewing couples, and the underlying lessons about relationships, love, and marriage. It's an incredible conversation, and I hope you all enjoy it. Before we get started, if you enjoy the episode or the show, subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform and drop a comment. So with all of that out of the way, please welcome my guest, Nate Bagley. Bagley, welcome to the show. How are you? Great. How are you, man? I am doing great, and it is awesome to have you on the show because I came across your story either on Business Insider or on a Reddit AMA, and I was pretty fascinated by what you do because you went from working a regular nine to five day to day job, and then on a whim, you decided to just drop that and travel the U.S. to interview couples of different backgrounds. Can you kind of just talk about how that decision came to be? Yeah, I'm a, it was kind of a crazy experience. You nailed it on the head. Um, I, I always, I mean, I think everybody has a, a dream of falling in love one day, you know? Mm-hmm. You want to you want to fall in love. You want to be with somebody that you, that you really connect with, and you want to have an amazing relationship. And yet, I growing up, I'd look around, and there were people who had okay relationships, but like there weren't a lot of. Every so often, I'd come across somebody, and I'd see their relationship, and I'd be like, "Oh my gosh, they got something special, <laughs> something." They've got something that nobody else really has. And I knew if I got married one day or or went into like a long-term relationship that I wanted to have that type of a relationship. But if you looked at my dating life up to that point, it was a train wreck. Uh, I just kept breaking up with these women I was dating over and over and over again. Like things just were not working out. And I just thought like, look, if, if the research shows – that nothing has a bigger impact on your overall happiness than the quality of your relationships. And the quality of my romantic relationship sucks right now. (laughs) And so if I want to have a happy and fulfilled life, I should probably figure out how to do this relationship stuff. So I, I kind of noodled on this idea for a while of interviewing couples who had that magical, mystical, amazing connection that I, that was different than everybody else's. And I'm like, man, if I could track down a bunch of them and interview them, maybe I could figure out what they're doing that everybody else is missing out on. And that question like stuck in my head long enough that I knew that if I ignored it, I would regret it. And so I ended up quitting my job to go interview those couples and see if I could figure out the secrets to true love so I could have a happy relationship one day. So what was kind of the process of finding these couples that were madly in love? Because it's it's really hard to judge from the outside who's in a yeah. great marriage and a really in a positive relationship and who's not. So when you're traveling across the US searching for these couples, what was kind of the criteria or the methodology for finding them? It wasn't very scientific, I'll tell you that. <laughs> um, typically, I just show up in a city, and uh, I was with my friend Melissa, and we would just talk to people and um, ask them like, "Who's who's the couple that you admire the most?" And we'd listen to people's responses and see if they lit up when they talked about this couple, and if they sounded interesting, we would ask for an introduction and see if we could connect with them while we were in town to do an interview. And it wasn't a perfect system. I, there's couples that I inter. Well, here's here's I think the most important thing. One mm-hmm. of the most important things that I I learned along the way is that um, not at first I went out expecting everybody to fit my definition of what true love was or what this magical mystical love that I was looking for was and what and was I real- that definition I don't know. I just, it was just kind of like a feeling. Like I wanted to, f- I wanted to find people who just really loved being around each other. That, like you could tell by just the way that they treated each other and the way that they spoke to each other that that they loved each other more than 
and treated each other with more kindness and respect than they would the the clerk at the grocery store. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, I did. I I don't know. I was just looking. I was looking for just. It's kind of indescribable, but just kind of like that chemistry and just an overall vibe that they really enjoyed being around each other. And the more couples I interviewed, the more I realized that there are as many definitions of true love as there are couples who have it. And just because, you know, I, I did interview couples and that I wasn't super smitten with or I wasn't impressed with. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, I'd walk away and be like, man, they, they still had something to teach me, even though I don't necessarily want to emulate everything in their relationship. There's something I learned. There's something that I could take away from every single couple that I interviewed. So, so you're telling me that love isn't black and white. It's kind of a gradient of different types of love that really reflect that couple's type of relationship. It isn't as if only one form of a relationship is perfect. There could be a variety of different ones that all work for that specific couple. Absolutely. I, I think the coolest thing about love is you get to create what it looks like for you and, and the person that you're with. And the sad thing is that there's a lot of people who are very passive with how they treat their relationships. They don't approach it with any intention. They don't look at it like, uh, I think love is a creative endeavor. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you look at, um, you have some people who do paint by numbers Right. Or they, they only do art by drawing within the lines in a coloring book. And there's other people who get a blank canvas and they get excited. Some people are intimidated by a blank canvas, but some people are excited because it means they can do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that the, the, the couples that I admire the most are the people who get excited about the blank canvas that is their relationship. And they intentionally put on that canvas the things that will bring them joy and happiness and fulfillment. Whereas a lot of people will only paint on the canvas if somebody else has drawn a picture for them of what their relationship should look like. And it makes them really uncomfortable to go outside the lines or use non-traditional colors or to experiment and get creative and be really thoughtful about what do I want, you know? Mm -hmm. In a sense, it's as if you're a ship that prefers to stay on the dock as opposed to sailing out into, into the ocean in reality here. And if what I'm understanding here is right, you are saying that people become used to the idea of comfort and they create th this form of structure around their day doing A, B, C, D, as opposed to going out in their lives and creating it as if it's a blank canvas and enjoying it for what it is. Beautifully said. I think people love being comfortable because being comfortable is safe and your brain's number one priority is to keep you alive. Mm-hmm. And if you are safe, it means there's no threats around. It means n there's no danger around. And your brain is doing a pretty dang good job. <laughs> and, and so your brain start, can relax a little bit. But but the, the interesting thing is that um, your relationships need more than just safety and predictability and stability and routine. We also need excitement and novelty and surprise and excitement and the unknown. That's what makes people interesting. That's why when we fall in love, like the part of the magic of falling in love, that Twitter patient stage comes from all the novelty and surprise. You're discovering somebody new for the very first time. And if you don't build that novelty and surprise and, and unpredictability into your relationship, you get bored and you, and, and so comfort, comfort is really, really good for people, but a lot of comfort in excess is a love killer. What do you think is the major cause for a relationship becoming predictable or following falling into a routine because from what I've seen most relationships people are always in that honeymoon phase for the first I guess three to six months and yeah. they're enjoying it they're doing all of these creative things but at some point everything just falls to a lull and they either just sit there all night watching Netflix or they just follow fall into a stagnant routine so what do you think is the major cause of that why do people do that? That is a good question. Um, there's so many answers to that question. <laughs> um, one of them is, is what I just talked about. It's easier to be comfortable. Mm -hmm. Like if you find that routine of Netflix and like watch dinner, watch or eat dinner, watch Netflix, and then go to bed every night, like it's comfortable. It's easy. It doesn't require, require any risk on your part. Um, but if you, I, I think being creative 
and being spontaneous requires a bit of mental energy and emotional energy and some vulnerability. It means you have to take off your armor and risk getting rejected. Mm. And so people, people, I think, tend to play it safe because it's less risky. There's less potential for them getting hurt. Um, and then it's also really easy to... It's so Dr. John Gottman is a marriage researcher and he's like the godfather of marriage research. And um, he, it's, the stuff that he's learned from his research is really fascinating. And one of my favorite quotes of his is it's the small things done often that make the difference. And in relationships, the, the, the hard thing about, about like a really amazing dynamic relationship mm -hmm. is that it, it requires you to do small things really frequently over an extended period of time. So what are some examples of like small things people can do? Because when I think of that, my immediate thought is, oh, take out the trash. Oh, get flowers for my significant other or treat them to a nice meal or something yeah, like that. Even smaller than that. Even smaller than that. Those, I would even consider some of those to be like, taking out the trash is a good one. But the over the top gestures, like things that you do on a more rare occasion, like you're not going to buy your partner flowers every day. Right. You know, you're not going to take your partner out for a fancy dinner every single day. <laughs> but the things that you do every day are the things that really make your relationship great. So let me give you some examples. Um, one, one example is uh, like giving your partner a passionate kiss. Mm -hmm. So if you kiss your partner for six to 10 seconds every day when you're reunited at the end of the day, like let's say they go to work or you go to work or you both go to work and then you come home and the moment you see each other, you just like pin each other against the wall and give each other a passionate 10 second kiss. That is a small thing done often that will make a huge difference that differentiates the couples from the, the couples who never kiss anymore or only peck to the couples who cultivate passion in their relationship. Um, another small thing done often is expressing gratitude for the things that are your partner's job. So hmm. this it's, it's really interesting. A lot of, I hear this from a lot of people. They say like, why should I thank him for doing that? Or why should I thank her, her for doing that? It's her job. Like it's her job to put the kids to bed at night, or it's his job to vacuum the floor or take the garbage out. Why should I thank him for that? And the reason that you thank them, it's thank, so I'll use an analogy here. So when you're teaching a kid to, let's say to walk, and it's just like little little toddler, you know, just over one years old, barely say a couple of words yet. And he's toddling, he's like starting to crawl and stand up and balance. And then you balance him up on, on their two feet one day and they take like one step and two step and they fall. And like, we don't react to that little baby and say, oh, you're so stupid. <laughs> I can't believe you can't even walk. Everybody else in our family can mm -hmm. walk. It's obvious you put one foot in front of the other and you can't even take more than two steps. You're dumb. Like, no, when, when a baby learns to walk and it takes two steps, we celebrate and we encourage the effort. And the more we encourage the effort, the more that baby has the courage to stand up and keep trying and keep walking. And it, it, it's actually, it, it releases reward chemicals in our brain, pleasure chemicals, you know, when we get praise and compliments and it makes us want to do more of that thing. And somehow, like, even when we start a relationship, when mm -hmm. you start dating somebody, you do that. You like, they hold your hand for the first time. And all of a sudden you're like, Ooh, I like that. I'm going to make my hand available so that they can hold my hand again. Or they kiss you for the first time. And you're like, Oh my gosh, that was so great. I'm like, and definitely text them when I get home and let them know how much fun I had. So they ask me out again and I can get more of those kisses and more of these dates and more mm -hmm. of these dinners and more of this alone time. And then when we get married, it's really frequent to, to see people go from rewarding their partner to get more of what they want to punishing their partner to get less of what, of what we don't want. And, and so like when you, when you are the person who rewards your partner for more of what you want, so like them helping you around the house, them, um, you know, like, uh, doing nice things for you, giving you compliments. When you praise that type of behavior, it actually incentivizes them to do more of that positive behavior. And it makes you an enjoyable person to be around. So you're saying it's, it's, it seems like it's a shift from having expectations to having appreciation for what a person does. And if you shift from expecting a person to do X, Y, and Z on a daily basis to just appreciating the small things that they do, then it kind of alleviates that pressure and allows that person to continue doing the positive things that they're doing. Like you said, it's positive reinforcement in the relationship. Yeah, it's it's uh 
I mean, it's important to have expectations, I think. I would say, I actually, I would rephrase that. Not expectations, but it's important to have clear agreements between mm -hmm. you and your partner. What's your responsibility? What's your partner's responsibility? How are you going to manage life together in a way that, like, your your partners, like, in a way that gets everything done and, and makes you both happy? Um, what I, I think a really good way to kind of clear, distill this is you've heard the term rose-colored glasses, right? Yep. So people when you express lots of gratitude and appreciation, um, you put on your rose colored glasses and you see things in a really positive way. There's actually research that shows that the opposite is also true. Um, there's this scientific principle, the psychological principle called neg negative sentiment override. And the basic principle behind it is that when you are critical of your partner, when you're upset and frustrated and looking for the bad in your partner, you actually perceive you miss, you, not only do you miss the positive interactions, but you start to perceive neutral interactions as negative. Hmm. And I like to call that the poop colored glasses. <laughs> so there are a lot of people who are suffering right now because they have poop colored glasses on. All they see are the negative things in their partner and their partner might even be doing positive things and they miss those things because they're so focused on the negative. And so when you put on your rose colored glasses, your your view of the world is actually more accurate than when you have critical poop colored glasses on what do you think is the cause of that though like when when it sounds like it distills down to a communication issue when people are fighting like you said people will perceive neutral actions or verbal statements as being negative so is yep. that more or less a communication issue more than anything else yeah, it's a, uh, you know, I think all communication issues can actually be boiled down, or the majority of communication issues can be boiled down to something more simple than that. Um, I think most communication issues are caused by a lack of friendship. Lack of friendship? What does that yeah, mean? Yeah, so let me, let me explain. So <laughs> um, when I say friendship, I'm actually thinking specifically of a, like a very specific definition of friendship. So um, the friendship I'm talking about consists of three specific things. The first is I know you. The second is I like you. And the third is I have your back. And if you think of any friend in your life that you're close to, these three things are present. You you know what's going on in their life. You know what, what makes them happy, what makes them sad, what they're excited about, what stresses them out. You know um, like what they do for work, who are the most important people in their life right now. Like you, you're kind of dialed in on what's going on in their world. So you, you know them pretty well. Um, you like spending time with them, like you enjoy their presence, you laugh when you're around each other, um, you you like do fun things together and you look forward to spending time together. And then the third, the I have your back is I tr you trust them. You know, you can confide in them. You know, they're not going to betray you. They're, they're not going to share your secrets that, that when you need them in a pinch, you could call them and they're going to be there no matter what. Mm -hmm. And if those three things are present, you have a really strong friendship. And in a lot of marriages, what I find is that when one of those three things gets weak or starts to fade, that the communication issues start to start to show up. You know, when, that, when you oh, go ahead. Is that what you would say you've noticed as being the most common similarity between the couples that have had re successful relationships and those who didn't have successful relationships? That's absolutely one of the biggest ones is that the most fulfilled couples have a really strong friendship. They focus on making sure that they are dialed in, they know each other, that they do things that they enjoy together, they like spending time together, and that they have each other's back. And there's little things that you can do, going back to that little things done often, mm -hmm. to strengthen each one of those pillars of friendship. There's little things you can do every day to strengthen your I know you pillar, your I like you pillar, and your I have your back pillar. And if you do that, what happens is that the conflicts that you're having start to disappear. Because most, most conflict and most frustration and, and people who get um, kind of burned out or start to, to feel distant from one another or kind of like what we were talking about earlier, they become a little bit resentful. They, they kind of right. um, start to – it's because one of these things – like if you don't know your partner, they start to feel like a stranger. You know, you you start to feel like more like roommates than lovers. I'm sure you've heard it's, that before. Yeah, been there. Yep, been there. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and that's and that's in large part because your I know you is weak, mm -hmm. and if you're if you're uh, if you're I like you is weak. Um, this is what I call a, a marriage of of mutual toleration. Um, these are the people who like they stay together for the kids. They probably know each other pretty well. 
and they have a common goal. So they kind of have to trust each other because they're raising kids or keeping a household running, but they don't really like spending time around each other. Mm -hmm. Um, A classic example of this from a a movie is Woody and Buzz. Like in that first Toy Story movie, Mm -hmm. they're stuck together (laughs) because they both love Andy and they know a lot about each other, but they hate each other's guts. And I see couples like this all the time. They like, they're together and they're married, but man, they don't really enjoy each other very much. They they roll their eyes at each other a lot. They don't laugh. They don't play. They just kind of like manage logistics and keep each other alive. I got to ask though, isn't that a yeah. case of one individual or the other individual in the relationship not putting in a hundred percent? And that's, and just to add to that, yeah, I yeah. always, I always hear the discussion in relationships go to, well, this person isn't putting in 100% or this pure, this person should only be putting in 60%, 50-50 or 125%. I mean, that's another <laughs> thing to it. Yeah, one of the things about relationships is that they're and, – and this is – it's really crappy. Um, but it's also really great is that relationships are inherently unfair. Really? Yeah, like there's going to be times in your life like – okay, here's a great example. So my wife is pregnant with our first child right now. Mm-hmm. She's she's five months along, and the or four months four or five months along, and the first she's four months along. There we go. I got it. <laughs> I'm paying attention. I'm an attentive husband. But she um she during her first trimester was super nauseous, and she needed a lot of rest and a lot of sleep and medication, and she was um, really stressed out and overwhelmed, and f- her body was full of hormones. And I had to pick up a lot of the slack. Like she, we have an agreement where she, the nights she was, she's a nurse. So she works three shifts a week mm-hmm. and the nights that she works, I always make dinner. And then the nights where she doesn't work, she always makes dinner. So we have this kind of trade off and she stopped making dinner like a couple months into being pregnant. And I'm, you know, she's not working. She's home all day. And I walk in the door after a long day of work and I'm like, uh, are you making dinner? And she goes, oh, man, I'm sorry. I haven't even thought about it. I'm like, what do you mean you haven't thought about it? You've been home all day. But like the reality is that what she needed at that time was to just rest and and disconnect and try and tolerate the constant nausea. And so that's not necessarily fair for me because she couldn't put in the 100% that she typically did does put into our relationship, I had to pick up the slack. And that's how relationships work is that, you know, you should always be putting in an effort to do your best, but sometimes your best is 30%. Mm-hmm. And sometimes your best is 50%. And sometimes it's a hundred percent. But uh, I think what, what is more important than, um, than how much effort you're putting in is your willingness to put in effort. I think oh. the real, the real danger is when people, check out and stop putting in any effort at all. And they just go on autopilot and they expect their, I don't know. They just, do you know what I mean? Like they, they just completely check out. That's when you, that's when you start getting resentment and frustration and people are like, man, I'm doing all this stuff. And it just seems like you're not even here. Mm -hmm. It it goes beyond the idea of splitting effort 50, 50 or 60, 40. It, It really boils down to, not taking others for granted and really just putting your best foot forward and putting in the necessary effort into the relationship. Because like you said, you you point out a really good example with your wife being pregnant. It's never always going to be 50, 50. Sometimes you have to make sacrifices or understand that the other person in the relationship is dealing with a bit more of a burden. And you kind of just have to pick up that slack because one day it might reverse and they're going to have to pick up the slack for you. Oh, it absolutely will reverse. Mm. It absolutely will reverse. (laughs) And so what's more important than the effort that each person is putting in is really being able to have a conversation about the effort. So the way that my wife and I responded to this situation is, um, you know, I, I started, I, I started noticing like, Oh, I'm getting frustrated. I'm becoming resentful. And we ended up having a conversation. We had a nice little walk and I was like, Hey, I just realized that the, that this, the, 
things have shifted in our relationship, like our, our context, our situation has shifted. And we haven't had a conversation about what that shift looks like as far as our responsibilities and roles go. So can we like make some new agreements here? And like, let's talk about what are you capable of? What do you want to do? And what do you think you can do? And what's, what do you need taken off your plate right now? How, what are the things I need to do to step up and kind of pick up the slack here so that we can, keep our household running. Mm -hmm. And it ended up being a really great conversation and the resentment went away and we created some mutual empathy and understanding. And when you feel understood, a lot of the friction and tension just goes, goes away. So more than anything, it's, it's important to be able to be in constant conversation about the shifting dynamics of your relationship. Mm. And the, the percentage doesn't matter. It's, it's just, it's, it goes back to the, I know you, I like you, I have your back. So I, I updated my, I know you, okay. My wife is stressed out. She's got tons of hormones and she's nauseous. My, I, I got to know what was going on in her life a little bit better because I wasn't really, it's easy to forget, man. When you're my, when she was pregnant, like those first couple months, she's not showing, like you don't see a baby in there and it's hard to like process in, in for me in my brain, like, Oh, she's pregnant. I'd forget sometimes that she had all this stuff going on in her body that I was unaware of. So I got to develop some compassion there. And then the, I like you, it's like, Oh, she doesn't want me to be stranded in the relationship doing everything. She felt guilty because she loves me. And the fact that she loves me makes me like her more. And the <laughs> fact that she appreciates the effort that I'm putting in to make her life a little bit easier while she is pregnant also makes me like her more. Mm -hmm. And then the, I have your back is like, Oh, you know, we're going to make this work no matter what, no matter how hard things get, like I'm going to pick up slack for you. You're going to pick up slack for me. We're a team and we strengthened those three things. And as soon as those things got strengthened, the conflict dissipated. It's like I, super magical. I can relate to that in the sense that I've kind of been through a lot of challenges in my current relationship early on. And I think that really just boils down to not focusing on the I know you or having your back or the trust aspects early on. My girlfriend is a teacher and at one point she had to go through this deep certification program even after her master's. And on top of that, you're dealing with the late hours with school, building lessons, lesson plans. And looking back now, I realized that a lot of that had to do with not really understanding or trying to process what it was that my partner was going through at the time and being more considerate of that fact. Now, all that considered, is that something you you kind of observed from your research or your interviews when you're looking at couples? Have you noticed that any of these lack of communications or lack of understanding their partner, do you think that had to do with how they were exposed to relationships as a child in the sense of, do you think that their parents gave them a bad image of what a relationship was? Or do you think we just oh, have yeah. a very odd social perspective on how relationships sh should work these days? Yes. All of the above. <laughs> um, the, 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 the upbringing quite part of the question, therapists call it family of origin issues. Mm -hmm. You know, like if you're, if you're raised in a family that um, when they're upset, they scream at each other mm -hmm. and you've never really been exposed to dealing with conflict or, bi or big emotions in a, in another way, you're just going to do what your family did. And I see, I I've seen couples really struggle with this where like one person comes from a more, we just don't talk about things. We sweep it under the rug and pretend it doesn't exist. And then it goes away. And then their partner is from a, no, we talk about it and we hash it out. <laughs> Gung ho. And yeah. And it causes a lot of anxiety. So your family of origin plays a really big role. And then just like culture and the, and the media, I, I actually, um, I did a survey with my email list a couple of, uh, it was like a year and a half ago. And, um, I sent out the survey, just asked a whole bunch of questions and got thousands of responses. And when I was going through the responses, there's one specific question that stood out to me. And the question was, um, do you have, is there a couple in your life that you really look up to and admire? And if so, what is it that you admire about them? And over 50% of the responses came back that people did not have a couple in their life whose relationship that they looked up to and admired. Wow. And it, it blew my mind. Like there are, we are shown a lot of examples of what not to do. 
And we, a lot of people grow up saying, I'm never going to repeat the mistakes of my parents, or they look, they look around in culture and they see, um, you know, Hollywood actors getting divorced and they see affairs and they see cheating and they see in TV shows, people screaming at each other and, and not knowing how to deal with their emotions and drama and all this stuff. And, and they're like, Oh, I guess that's just how it is. Mm -hmm. And, um, most people just honestly don't get exposed to somebody who has the type of relationship that makes them go, wow, I really want that. And so part of my mission in doing this project was just to shine a light on some of these couples who are doing it right, because there are more than we think. And when you kind of catch a glimpse of how amazing a, a long-term committed relationship can be, if you do it right, it's one of the most inspiring and fun and exciting things that you can be a part of. It's, mm -hmm. it's awesome. Do you think that the exposure to all these different forms of media, what we see from celebrities, what we see from Disney movies, and from everything we read on in news articles, is providing society with an extremely jaded view of what a relationship looks like, which in turn kind of results in how they treat they treat their own significant others and how it ultimately results in many of the divorces we see today. Absolutely. There's this psychological principle called behavioral contagion. Right. And the idea behind it is that you do the things that the people around you do and you do the things of the people that you watch or pay the most attention to. So that's why like um, when a celebrity takes their own life, there's a spike in suicides around the, around the world. Or if a girl at high school gets pregnant, um, it's not uncommon for several other girls within a few months to also become, get, get pregnant, like have an unwanted pregnancy. And it's just like, we do the things that the people around us do. And so if we're constantly exposed to like dads being a doofus or, <laughs> or um, like, women, women, uh, only being not, not being competent enough to like be a, a mom and a working professional mm -hmm. or, you know, there's all these stereotypes and these tropes that we see in the movies or people not being able to control their emotions when they're upset, you know, all these little things that we get exposure to, we mimic, you know, if you watch desperate housewives or the bachelor and you love the drama, and then you and then you go and duplicate that drama and you and you have similar conversations in your house and then you wonder why you're unhappy like part of the reason is that be, it's because you are catching it's like if you think of emotions like coronavirus you're being infected by the behaviors and the emotions and the values and and the the thought processes of the people that you're paying the most attention to mm. so so it's, so it's, who, a, it's a reflection of what you see out there and you're pushing it back into your own life. hundred percent, hundred percent. So if you, if you are uh, like a woman who was raised on Disney movies <laughs> and now you kind of act like you're the damsel in distress and you need a man to come save you and complete you, that's like, it's a thing that, that a generation of women ha dealt with and, and are dealing with, mm -hmm. you know, if you, if you were raised as Homer Simpson, as your example of a dad. Now, Homer does have some redeeming qualities for sure. Like he loves his family and stuff, but he's a doofus, mm -hmm. you know? And if that's your experience of what men are and how a husband is, then like you're, and that's how you're showing up is that you're just a beer drinking kind of partying. Don't I avoid responsibility and do the minimal amount of work that I need to do then like, yeah, that's, that's going to be contagious that that informs who you show up as later on in life. So yeah, it's, it sounds like we become what we think. So as we see others do, we manifest that into our own lives. And it, it's, it's kind of upsetting to see because a lot of media portrays relationships and couples in such a jaded way that you have to wonder how are couples who are successful doing so despite having exposure to all of these different influences. Yeah. It's a, that is the question that I had, you know, mm -hmm. how are these couples doing so well when everybody else is struggling? Mm -hmm. You know, the, Oh, go ahead. I was going to tie it back into the interviews you've done because you interviewed a wide range of couples from 
various backgrounds, including gay couples, straight couples, rich couples, poor couples, religious, atheist, you name it, you've done it. And it, it, I have to ask from that, have you noticed some that are more cohesive than others, despite the range of backgrounds you've interviewed? Like like a trend in mm -hmm. like are religious couples happier than non religious couples or are exactly. gay couples happier than than straight couples, um, that is a good question. I there I don't know if there's a hard and fast rule here. Like it, it's it seems like um, more than anything, it it's I, I don't think the qualifiers that we would use to categorize successful relationships and unsuccessful relationships would be the ones that we would think of. Does hmm. that make sense? Can you elaborate on that? Like the things that we typically focus on are to, to group people mm -hmm. are like um, religious or non-religious or are they interracial or do they share the same political views or um, do they share, obviously they're going to share the same like sexual preference. Like they're going to, um, like a, a gay a gay person is unlikely to marry a a, a straight person, mm -hmm. um, but those I would I would say that those um, those classifications are probably not the ideal classifications to um, to pair people together. Mm. I think the people that that um, probably are best suited for each other have similar core values. Uh, okay, I see. So it brings up a good point, though, because you often hear people say, well, we're madly in love, or despite all the challenges and struggles we go through, I love you. But from what I can tell, the reality is, is that love is not enough. And that for people to have mm. really successful and powerful relationships, there has to be, like you said, core belief systems that they both share, whether it be religious, political, uh, family, uh, monetary, there has to be something that anchors the relationship down to which they both can not necessarily revert to, but something they both can cling to despite yeah. the challenges. I would say that the most important quality that you can look for in a partner is a commitment to growth commitment to growth and a commitment and, to growth. Yeah, yeah. It's a good point uh, you make because like you said, a lot of couples become stagnant and yep. they just fall into a similar pattern. So when you say become the couple who lives off growth, that is inviting the idea of trying new things, becoming adventurous, learning new things, growing as individuals and growing as a couple yep. basically and and then when trials and struggles come your way you don't look at those as oh i guess we're just not destined to be together <laughs> i guess this isn't just it isn't meant to be I, I i chose the wrong person you start looking when you have a growth when you have that growth mindset you look at your your trials and your struggles as opportunities and it's like oh look at this thing that we're bumping into Imagine how much more amazing our relationship will be when both of us level up so that this problem is just a little bump in the road. This thing that's like bringing us to a standstill, it's like a complete roadblock. It could be just like a little speed bump if we are willing to grow past it. And then it becomes exciting. Like your your conflict becomes an opportunity to connect and to evolve and to become a better version, not only of yourself, but a better version of you as a couple, as, as the two of you together. It's like that... That one thing alone, if you have two people who show up and say, hey, whatever comes our way, we're going to face it together and we're going to figure out how to conquer it. And I'm not going to back away from this challenge if you aren't. And not just a, from a stubborn perspective, but from an actual like, I want to learn from this and become better as a result of it. That mm -hmm. unlocks a, 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 a sense of like bonding and meaning that a lot of couples who just have maybe like a shared religion or shared political values, they they won't get the same bang for their buck as if they were connected through that commitment to growth. Is that something you would say you've noticed in any of the uh, the couples you've interviewed? And when I say that, have there been couples that who have struggled early on in their relationship, but who maintained the growth mindset and cohesive mindset 
to get through certain challenges that ultimately it kind of pushed them together and they grew as a couple. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. There's uh, several, I mean, my wife and I would be a great example. Um, Mm -hmm. We like, we, we've had plenty of bumps in the road and we've only been married for a handful of years. Like um, for in the first, in the first six weeks of our marriage. So we got married and then two weeks later, so we went, we got married, we went on our honeymoon, we came home and my sister got married. And then two weeks after that, my grandma passed away. So the first six weeks of our, of our life was wedding, wedding, funeral. Mm -hmm. And, and, and my wife started school and I started a new job. So like, it's a lot of stress, you know, mm-hmm. and you can let that stress ruin your relationship and pull you apart, or you can let it bring you together. Then about six months into our marriage, my wife blew out her back and wow. spent like two to three months, literally like couldn't get out of bed. Mm-hmm. And I was helping her put her pants on and I was helping her like bend over and pick things up off the floor and she couldn't go to work. And it was really stressful. And she got super depressed and discouraged. And we've, we've like done some really interesting um, podcasts and stuff on this, but like <laughs> those, those trials gave us an opportunity to like reflect inward and say, okay, like, what are we going to do when depression shows up in our relationship? What are we going to do mm-hmm. if an injury shows an unexpected injury shows up in our relationship? Um, it's, you just, you learn to make, um, lemon lemonade out of lemons. It's interesting. You say that I, I I've always been fascinated with arranged marriages and yeah. how they end up working. I know a few of them. And there's this idea that people in arranged marriages, I mean, they obviously don't choose to be in that marriage. And it's arranged by either the parents or another authority. But for some reason or another, arranged marriages tend to be more long lasting and have lower divorce rates than other marriages. And it could be for a variety of reasons, whether it be outside pressures or anything else. But is there something that you noticed was different about their relationships when you were interviewing them? Well, yeah, there's a, there's a couple of things. Um, Like one, you got to understand that some societies like, let me rephrase. Um, A lot of, a lot of marriages do last a long time. But I I think the length of time that you are married is not a good measuring stick for the quality of your marriage. Mm. And I'm not saying that people in arranged marriages who've been married for a long time do not have a a, a great marriage. But what I am saying is that that's not the greatest measuring stick. Um, Because there's a lot of societies, especially religious societies, whether um, you're Christian or Hindu or Buddhist or whatever, a lot of highly religious societies, they, um, they frown on divorce. And so people will stay together, even though they're absolutely miserable or in an abusive relationship because they're scared of the societal stigma that comes attached to walking away from a marriage. So uh, that being said, there are a lot of people who have arranged marriages that have incredible marriages. And I think it's because culturally they often approach marriage different than the rest of the Western world. Um, And one of the things that like, I remember interviewing uh, one of the arranged marriage couples that I interviewed and they said, one of the greatest parts about the arranged marriage is that they, they got to spend like the first two or three years of their life, just like discovering things about each other. They didn't, they dated for their first (laughs) year, year or two of their marriage and they got to know each other's families and they got to show up and be really curious. And like their families took a lot of pride in putting a lot of time and energy and thought into pairing them together. And they wanted to discover like, what are the qualities that you see in this person and in this family that you wanted me to be a part of? And it can be this like really beautiful um, discovering of values and personality traits and, sh- and, um, shared interests. And, uh, I think the fact that they do put so much of a focus on friendship right out of the gate, um, it actually contributes to establishing like this kind of really strong foundation in their relationship. Whereas a lot of people in the Western world, uh, especially if you come from a religious background, the reason that you marry, not the only reason, but, a, a reason that kind of might push you to get married more quickly is to have sex, like to have a, a, a consistent sexual partner. Mm-hmm. And, and I would say friendship is a better foundation for your relationship than, than sex. So it's interesting that you bring up how those in arranged marriages tend to 
view the relationship as something to be exciting and to grow from and to just observe it from a fashion that you're charting unknown territory. Yeah. On, on the flip side, though, in today's world, I believe dating is more or less kind of a recent phenomena. Have you noticed there to be some dichotomy or interesting facets about dating as opposed to um, arranged marriages? Oh, not off the top of my head, to be honest with you. I mean, I think dating is really interesting, but I've never really compared or thought about um, how dating contrasts with a, a society that focuses more on arranged marriages. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm not 100% sure what I'd say about that. I mean, at least I'm just going to chime in. I think my perspective, yeah, go ahead. I, I've noticed at least that when people begin to date, they become more so jaded than not because they will experience one relationship, realize that it isn't good for a variety of reasons, and that will shape how they go into their next relationship and then into into their next relationship. And I think it forces people to fall into kind of a hedonistic structure in their lives where they think it's okay just to keep on dating and not falling into uh, into a, a strong relationship. Or they'll say to themselves, I'm going to date, but then I'm going to become madly in love with that person. And it kind of builds a relationship that's more or less one-sided because they want to get married, but another person may not be ready to get married. So I think dating has oh, had yeah. a really interesting impact on how people view relationships and how it impacts their marriages for sure dating is oh man i could talk for like (laughs) five five hours on dating and how even just how dating has evolved in the last five five to ten years Mm -hmm. um it's it's, interesting it's really really interesting Mm -hmm. um the one thing i would say if they're to the single person or people listening to this relationship is um a lot of times we don't step back and like really think about the goals that we have when we're dating. I remember I started dating as a teenager and the reason I started dating was to have fun. Like <laughs> I wanted to hang out with girls. I wanted to have a girlfriend. I wanted to like kiss a girl and cuddle with a girl. Like I wanted to like explore this new kind of like budding pubescent body. Like, you know, it's you get all these hormones and it's just like exciting, you mm-hmm. know, it's exciting to practice being in relationships with people and having fun with your friends. And, um, and then like, as we grow up, I don't know how many times I actually thought back about how my approach to dating should change based off of what my goals in life were. And I remember when I got into my mid twenties, I realized like, Oh my gosh, I'm still dating. I'm in college and I'm still dating. Like I was in high school. Mm-hmm. Like I I just am going out to have fun and I'm going out to like sometimes find somebody to hook up with or I'm going to to find somebody who can give something that I'm looking for, fill some hole for me. Um, Don't take that literally. Uh, (laughs) But then when I shifted my perspective and actually started looking for – looking look getting really clear on what I wanted in a partner, Mm -hmm. my approach to dating changed and my results changed changed as well so did you first off feel a lot of pressure to settle down when you were in the mindset of dating one person and the next and then secondly how did you kind of reconcile that shift from dating to marriage in a positive way there was a little there was a little bit of uh, pressure there was a lot of there's a lot of cultural and familial pressure i had mm-hmm. um several younger siblings get married before me and my parents were kind of like eh, is it ever going to happen and um and i come from a very very family centered uh kind of community and, and and culture and so people often tend to get married in their in their 20s and then just pressure from myself like i definitely like dating can be exhausting And there's, there comes a point, there came a point for me in my like late twenties where I, I, I just said to myself, I, I don't want to be alone. Like, I don't want to just share my, my life with roommates coming home to an empty house every night is getting exhausting. The idea or the prospect of having a companion that I love to share my life with me was really exciting. So there was a little bit of pressure to like find a person, but when I changed my approach to dating, it actually became kind of fun. 
Um, and like one of the things that I did is I decided that when I, I'd go on lots of first dates and when I had chemistry with somebody, I would just like get off all the apps, stop swiping, you know, get off Bumble, get off Tinder. And I would just ask this person out, um, a, you know, once or twice a week and see where things went before I let myself get distracted by another shiny object. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, by, by date two or three, maybe four, if things were, were still going well, I would have a conversation with them and just be like, Hey, look, I'm enjoying spending time with you. Um, I want to see if this thing has legs, if you're open to it and you have the same kind of relationship goals as I do, why don't we try being exclusive for like a month and set a date on the calendar where we can like come back and revisit and see if we're both enjoying this, are we both liking it? If we don't, if one of us is like, eh, I'm not feeling it, then we can part ways. But it's like a micro commitment. Like we get to experiment with what it's like to be in relationship with each other, see how we deal with conflict, see how we like treat somebody that we're in a relationship with. And then we have a time to evaluate and part ways as like without it being awkward or weird if it's not working. And then, or we can continue to keep the momentum up if it is working. And that is sorry, but that is a yeah. really positive way about shifting from a dating lifestyle to a I'm going to find somebody that's a good fit for me for marriage mentality. Yeah. Because I've noticed a lot of people, and the reason I was asking these questions was because I've noticed a lot of people going from the dating lifestyle to all of a sudden feeling pressure to get married, but they never really put that structure or that rigidity around what it is that they want in a relationship or what it is that it's important to them. So they'll just go to that next person and settle because they want to get married. So I yeah. think it's awesome that you kind of just told yourself, I want this in my relationship. I'm going to date initially and see if that person fits and then we'll go from there. Yep, it, it dude, it changed everything. <laughs> and, and it was like, I'm all, oh, this is how adults treat relationships. Mm -hmm. We can talk about our desires and we can talk about commitment and it doesn't have to be awkward. And I see so many people in their twenties and thirties that are dating and they're like, they're still in the high school. Does he like me? Doesn't he like me? Does she want to commit to me? Does she not want to commit to me? Is she dating somebody else? And I don't know about it. And like, there's all this anxiety I, just cause that's like, we don't stop and think, Hey, maybe I should change the way that I approach this based off of the phase of life that I'm in. And I think that I, to me, dating is like a, an opportunity. It's like a filtering opportunity. There are so many people in the world. And the reason that you date is when you get to the point where you're dating for like marriage, dating, the goal of dating is just to filter out all the people who aren't a good fit as quickly as possible. So you can discover the people who are a pretty good fit for you. Mm -hmm. There's nobody that's a perfect fit, but if you, if you stop taking rejection personally and you start looking at rejection as a, Oh good. I found somebody else who's an easy no. So I can whittle down and get closer to the person who's a yes, man, it, it, it just speeds up the process of finding the person that you want to spend the rest of your life with. So like, I remember taking a girl out on a couple of dates and then she started to ghost me. Like she just stopped responding to me. <laughs> and so I ended up just call, like, I went to her house, I think. And I was like, Hey, I don't want to be weird. I don't want to be that guy that's like overbearing or doesn't take, take a hint, but we went on a couple of dates. I really enjoyed it. I wanted to ask you out some more. I thought you were having fun. Um, if you're not interested, I'm not going to take it personally. I just wanted to, I don't want to be presumptuous and just assume you're not interested if you are, and you've just been busy. And I also don't want to be overbearing if I'm that, you know, if I'm not taking a hint. So can we, do you want to talk about it? And she was like, actually, this guy that I dated back in the day came back in my life and I really have enjoyed spending time with you too, but I feel weird like not giving this guy another chance. And I was like, great, good luck. If it doesn't work <laughs> out and I'm available, give me a call. And if it, and if it does work out, I'm very happy for you. And I didn't take it personally. And then the very next person that I went on a date with was my wife. Wow. That's incredible. I, yeah. I, I, I really think that mindset people have is really just a byproduct of technology such as cell phones and apps like Hinge or Tinder because it gives people a way to kind of build this avoidant mentality where they have the ability just to walk away freely. I know you mentioned oh, yeah. the word ghosting and that really yep. stands out because people, <laughs> if they don't want to talk to you, they can just delete your number, they could block you, whatever the case is. People have the ability just to put away, set and forget 
and just and, move on to and not and not take any responsibility. <laughs> and I think yeah. that's a big part of it. People don't really want to take responsibility of, of these things. They kind of just want to live a free life. They want to be able to just to go out and do what they want and not really take into consideration the thoughts of others or the feelings of others. And it, it kind of exacerbates itself with the use of technology and social media and what yeah. have you. Definitely. And it's important to think about if you, it's important to consider that if you are the type of person who's looking for a long-term committed relationship and somebody treats you that way, it's, it says more about them than it says about you. And it's a great signal that they're not, and they don't have the same relationship goals as you do. Mm. I think, I think that should be one of the first things that you talk about on a date with somebody is just like casually get an idea of what it is they want out of a relationship. What do you think are some of the keys? I mean, you can just narrow down to three, but what do you yeah. think are some of the most important questions somebody should ask on a date to filter out or weed out those that aren't a match for them? Yeah. Number one is what are you looking for in a relationship? Because if, if one person's looking, I, I have seen so many people waste years and years and years of their life trying to get somebody to commit who doesn't want to commit. Like we have great chemistry and we share, <laughs> and we share values and I really love his family and his family really loves my family, but he just doesn't want to get married. And I do. Mm-hmm. And, and they wait and they wait and they wait and they wait. And then years go by. And then finally one day it doesn't work out and they're heartbroken because they've spent all this time and energy investing in a relationship that didn't give them what they wanted. And that can be prevented if just first date, you just go, Hey, so like, I don't know. We're both single. We're on a date. What are you looking for in a relationship? Are you looking for like something casual? Are you open to committing if something like great comes along? Are you looking to get married sometime in the near future? Like what are your, what do you want out of a relationship? Cause if you're looking, if they're looking to have fun and you're looking to commit, that's a great signal of like, ah, uh, nice to meet you. <laughs> but this let me know. Work. <laughs> yeah. Well, just let me know if your goals change, uh-huh. you know, cause I'm in, I'm in a position right now where I'm like looking to settle down or I'm looking to find a person who's ready to commit to something more long-term if things, if things go well, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to propose to you right now, obviously, but like, you know, if, if we have great chemistry, I don't, I don't want to like get my hopes up that this is going to turn into something more long term and you're just not in a position like financially or in your life or your career where that's even something you're interested in. So mm-hmm. that's one question to ask. Um, I think another great question to ask is just like get something that would give you a, a grasp as to like what, what their core values are, what is their relationship with the, the people who are most important to them, whether that's their, their close friends, their, their chosen family or their blood family. Um, it's probably good to gauge like sense of humor. Um, you know, just like find out if your personalities are going to mesh. Um, if, if you think something is hilarious, if, if, I don't know, like my hope is that when somebody gets married, that they share a lot of laughter together and your, if your sense of humor doesn't match up with somebody, like that's a great sign that uh, maybe we're not going to have a great time spending the rest of our lives together. On the point of people and being in relationships at the time, though, would you say that people with similar personalities or dissimilar personalities seem to last the longest? Because you often see the the phrase opposites attract. And uh-huh. I'm assuming that refers to opposite personalities attract. Have you noticed any discrepancies or interesting aspects of that? It works both ways. Sometimes it's birds of a feather flock together and sometimes it's opposites (laughs) attract. Um, You know, sometimes you meet people and they seem like clones of each other and it's like super funny. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you meet people who are just, they're they're like complementary to each other. um, Like, I, I, and it's not always personality. Sometimes it's just like, uh, I don't know, like character traits. You know, sometimes somebody's a little bit more of a neat freak and the other person's a little bit more cluttery and they balance each other out. Like the cluttery person makes the neat freak loosen up a little bit and the neat freak makes the the cluttery person kind of be a little bit more tidy or maybe somebody's a little bit more on time and the other person's really late or somebody's more of a spender and the other one's more of a saver. The question is, is if they can cultivate that that friendship that we talked about, that I know you, I like you, and I have your back, those, those conflicts, those perpetual conflicts don't have to destroy the relationship. They just become a great opportunity for you to like learn more about yourself, to seek compromise and to grow as a couple and as human beings. So there's, you're never going to be a perfect identical match for somebody, Mm 
Um, I think what you're looking for is, I don't know, kind of like gears of a clock. Are, are there areas of your life where you can help move each other forward and, and keep the marriage in motion? Mm, I like that, keeping it in motion. And it really kind of goes back to the idea of having that growth mindset and wanting yep. to build something together. And that really stands out to me. Um, one thing that I've always wondered about in a day and time where there's a lot of pressures from social media and you see a lot of couples post their their best images and they put their best foot forward uh, showing their best life how are some ways couples can kind of reconcile and shift away from the pressures from seeing couples post such stories on their instagram profiles or their facebook profiles and how can they kind of move away from that misconstrued or jaded per, uh, perception of what a relationship is. Yeah. Uh, comparison is definitely the thief of joy. Mm-hmm. Um, one w- I would say is just like limit your social media time. And then another great thing to do is like have time every week where you can sit down and talk about the things that are going really great in your relationship. Like maybe it's every Sunday afternoon over lunch or brunch, you sit down with your partner and you just say, what are all the great things that happened this week? (laughs) Big things and little things. Like let's celebrate some stuff together. Remember how I emptied the dishwasher this week and then you came in and just gave me a big hug and a kiss and told me thank you? I loved that. I love that we have that type of gratitude and appreciation in our marriage. Or, you know, remember how like you crushed that project at work and you nailed it and your boss gave you a pat on the back? You are amazing. Like you're such a great partner and you work so hard for our family. I doubt there's many people who have the type of relationship that we have. And I'm just so proud of you. You're such an awesome partner. Like there's this, there's this concept it's called um, positive illusions. And it's one of the, it's one of the, the distinguishing factors between couples who feel like they won the lottery and couples who just kind of squeak by or, or just kind of like survive life together. And the, the people who feel like they've won the lottery, they, they constantly reaffirm how they, I mean, the positive illusions that they have are, are not always accurate. They're blown out of proportion. They're like overly positive. And that's okay. It's great. It's great. It's great to feel like you are the luckiest person on earth. (laughs) And it's great to reinforce that story that nobody else in the world has a relationship like we have. And we are so lucky that we're the only ones who get to experience this. It's better to live with the rose colored glasses than the shit glasses, so to speak. Absolutely. I want to die feeling like the luckiest man alive. And if that means I have to tell myself an exaggerated version of the truth on a, on a regular basis, and that's what it takes, man, I'm okay with that because that means at the end of my life, I'm going to go out like thinking I'm the luckiest man in the world. <laughs> and I think it's important to cultivate that type because you have to combat the, that comparison, the thief of joy. You have to com- combat the, the criticism and the negativity and, the, and the, the, the crap that we get from the news cycles and the insecurities that we get from watching the picture perfect Instagram family. And like, there's all these things that we have to, that we have to to fight against in order to preserve our sanity and to make us feel like we're we're worthy of of you know and we're worthwhile Mm -hmm. and one of the greatest things that you can do is just like just do that just set aside time every week to celebrate your love wow i mean i i can relate because my girlfriend and i do this thing where we try to do every night or at least as often as possible but she does this thing where it's called three good things and yeah it's really just take a moment to say what are three good things that have happened in our day or our week. And we kind of just amplify that by having a journal we use uh, where we write uh, good things that have happened to us. Yeah, like a gratitude journal. Exactly. And then one of the things we also do, which kind of relates to one of your projects you, you have, is we have a book, a date book, where it lists out all these scratch cards. And you don't know you don't know what it is, but when you take the scratcher and remove it it gives you a date to do on whatever day you want based off a certain price using a certain topic at hand and then you take a picture i love it and it it reminded me of one of the projects you have which oh yeah 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 back is i I started a company back in the day called unbox love that's it unbox love and it kind of reminds me of that can you kind of uh tell me a little bit about 
the idea behind that and how it relates yeah yeah that's so i built and sold that company a while ago but it's it was a fun idea like the the idea behind it is i date nights are great because at the very beginning of our conversation, we talked about how safety and security and predictability are things that we crave and can oftentimes get in excess in a relationship. Mm-hmm. And and I feel like a lot of people use date nights and they perpetuate the 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 same the same old same old. They get stuck in a rut. They have a <laughs> habit. They like do dinner in a movie and they go right. to the same same restaurant every week, you know. And they're like, "Will we go on date nights?" And I'm like, "No, a date night." is supposed to introduce novelty and surprise and new experiences and help you see your partner in a new way. Maybe not every single date night needs to do this, but a lot of the time, like this is one of the great things that date night can give you is it can it can give you a fresh take on your partner and that that like fosters desire and it fosters passion and all these great things that we want in our relationship so that they don't get boring. And so I, I'm like, man, I, I wanna provide couples an easy way to have this type of novelty and surprise in their date nights. So I decided I would start curating um, with my buddy, Steve. We put together a series of of dates in a box that we would (laughs) curate like activities and products. And then once a month, we'd send them out to couples all over the United States and they would open it up and they would have like a really cool date night. And we gave them like questions to ask each other and, and games to play. And the goal was to help kind of foster that passion and connection in the relationship. That is awesome. I absolutely love it because like you said, it kind of fosters the relationship and kind of forces people to grow together and use creativity to kind of work through different problems in different ways. And that's one of the things the book allowed us to do because one of the things we did with it was have a paint night and it kind of forces you to look at things uh, creatively, find different things to paint and kind of paint it together. So I love the idea of the unbox it product you did, and that just Dude, you, really you and your there. girlfriend are doing it right. I mean, I'll, I'll be I'll be quite. I'm proud of you. <laughs> I'll be candid here. It was never uh, rain, sunshine and rainbows. I mean, we had a lot of hard work to go through, and there's a, there were a lot of challenges over the year. But what I realized that kept us together, uh, besides having some concrete uh, anchors in our life that's important to both of us, it was really just going at challenges with an us mindset and working through them with a never quit mentality. It's, we had this growth mindset of if we have a challenge that we struggle through, we'll even just sit down, use sticky notes or journals to work through our arguments or tough conversations if we had to. We Brilliant. would literally try everything possible to maintain a level of growth. And a lot of the things you kind of pointed out were kind of um, re- resembling that or kind of so relatable to me in my own relationship. So I love that. That's awesome, dude. It's it's like, it's not me versus you, it's us versus the world. Exactly. And that's like the mentality people need to have. And I mean, just for a second to go back to the interviews you had with the couples across the US, I mean, has there been any that really stood out to you in a positive way or one that made you go, wow, that is amazing or that is what love really is? Yeah, there's a couple. Um, one of one of them that stands out right now in my mind. They they become um, some of our best friends. Uh, my wife and I. Mm-hmm. Uh, their so their names are uh, David and Gretchen. And the one of the most important lessons that they that they taught me. I remember I went to their house um, to interview them, and I knocked on their door, and they greeted me very enthusiastically. And I loved <laughs> I loved the enthusiasm. And I walk in their house, and they're like, "Okay, we are not allowed to do an interview until we feed you dinner." And I'm like, "No oh, kidding." Okay, so so Gretchen was cooking dinner, and David was kind of like entertaining me in the kitchen. And um, as dinner was kind of getting closer to ready, David David started talking to Gretchen, and he's like, "Hey, babe, what can I what can I do to help you? Can I set the table?" And she goes, "Oh, sweetie, that would be so great." Thank you so much. He goes, no problem, honey. Um, <laughs> let, wh- do you know where the napkins are? I can't find them. And she's like, oh, sweetheart, I think they're in the back of the drawer. And he goes, oh, you're the best. Thanks so much. And they're just like being so sweet and so nice to each other. And I'm standing there going, okay, this is like a little right over here. the yeah, it's a little <laughs> over the top. It's a little over almost sickly sweet. And I I was totally judging them. And so we sat down, we had dinner, we started the interview, and I, I'm like, you guys, I gotta ask. Like I've been watching you interact all evening and I I've never really seen a couple talk to each other the way that you do, and it, it seems like almost a little fake right is this are you guys putting on a show for me because i'm interviewing you or is this like legitimately how you treat each other 
And they just kind of looked at me with sympathy in their eyes. And, and David says, um, Nate, I got to tell you something. Early on in our marriage, we noticed that there are there were a lot of couples who would treat like the teller at the bank or the bagger at the grocery store with more kindness and respect than they would treat their own partner. Mm -hmm. And we made it a goal at the very beginning of our marriage that that he said Gretchen will always know that she is the most important person to me by the way that I speak to her and the way that I treat her through my actions and my words. So we always use our pleases and thank yous. We always treat each other with kindness and respect. We're always, you know, trying to use words of affection and and love and compliments and gratitude in our relationship because I don't if somebody were to walk in this house and see how we talk to each other, I would want them to know instinctively that this is the most important person to me in my life. And I was like so embarrassed. <laughs> when I heard him say that, I'm like, man, I'm a student of this stuff. I, I, I like, I do research. I, I've interviewed couples all over, and I've never heard anybody articulate that in that way. And I can honestly say, after knowing David and Gretchen for several years now, that that is just how they are. And now I've stolen that, and that's how I try and show up with my wife. And I'm not successful all the time. It's something I definitely work on, but that made such a huge impact on me. And I, I started to think, like, how would the world be if if everybody treated their partner with that one concept in mind, I, I am going to speak to you and, and treat you in such a way that you will have no question in your mind that you are the most important person in the world to me. Hmm. That, that one principle could change the world. It would transform families. It would transform communities. It, 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 man, it's, it, it just blew my mind. It's like putting – it's making sure – that you treat your significant other with the most utmost respect and showing them that they are important to you and that they are the number one person in your life and that you ultimately have their back. And I think it really goes beyond the golden rule of treating those around you how you want to be treated. It's making sure that you put in that 125% to make sure that that significant other, that person right across from you is the person that you love and that you're going to treat immeasurably better than everyone else around you. Not to say you shouldn't treat others with respect. I think the golden yeah. rule applies, but it's really showing the person you love them and that you care about them and that you have their back and that you know them ultimately. For sure. Going going back to that, the, the what we talked about earlier on about how marriage isn't always fair. One of the greatest things about marriage is sometimes we just get treated better than we deserve. <laughs> which is Which really goes back to your point of you have to kind of die thinking I'm the luckiest person in the world because... If you treat your significant other like that and they treat you like that, it really goes to show that they're living that mentality. They're living those words or that 100%. sentiment. Wow. Yep. It's those small things done often, man. If you if you cultivate that delusion of being madly in love every single day, if you keep doing your gratitude journal every single day, if you like want something you could consider doing, like ask your ask your girlfriend every night, say, Hey, what's one thing you love about me? The thing that you love most about me today. And then answer the same question for her. Like, keep cultivating these little opportunities to just like see the good in each other and and see how fortunate you are to be with each other. And like, think of what's one thing that you could do every day to make her feel loved and adored. Mm -hmm. You just do one little thing every single day that builds up over time, and you will ruin her for any other man. Like she would, you know, you want to you want to get to the point where it's like. I can't imagine life with anybody else but you because you just treat me so freaking well. Mm -hmm. I so. think it's an incredible idea. I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna start doing that actually and see what happens. <laughs> um, one of the couples you interviewed, you asked them why they thought so many relationships fail, and they said your expectation is that you're expecting stuff and not giving stuff, and this immediately reminded me of a video I once saw and this man starts talking about what love is and he kind of draws a very interesting comparison to something called fish love and he goes on to explain that in this type of love this individual is eating a fish and he tells another person I'm eating this fish because it tastes good and he begins to wonder he loves the fish because it tastes good and then realizes that he doesn't love the fish. He loves himself. And 
the reality or realization mm. he came to was that relationships today follow a similar dynamic because people often look at what the other individual can provide them. But on the contrary, true love is a love of giving. So in, in other words, you love those to whom you give. Because if I give you something, I have invested myself to you. So in the same way that we all love ourselves, part of me is now with you. Do you do you find that true or what are your thoughts on that? I just took a bunch of notes. I love <laughs> that analogy. Um, I'm going to have to send you the video afterwards, but it was kind of I one of the most that. awe-inspiring videos I've ever seen on what love is and the comparison it drew to what fake love is versus what real love is. And it's it really boils down to love is giving. Love is giving a part of yourself that you love to another person in hopes that they become you 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 begin to love them because part of you is with that person. Yeah. I think I think ultimately, I mean there's a lot of ways to define love, but one of the one of the signs that you really love somebody is that you're willing to sacrifice um in a healthy way but you're willing to make sacrifices or experience discomfort in order at the expense or, or in order to contribute to the well-being of the other person. That's hmm. I, I guess a, a good thing. I'm, I'm willing to put myself in an uncomfortable place in order to contribute to the well-being of my wife, in order to help her grow, experience joy, experience happiness and satisfaction. If that means I have to work or I have to go through something a little painful or difficult, Man, I'm willing to do that. And there's a, I, I see a lot of people who their relationships would be blessed if they, if, if they would be willing to lean into the discomfort a little bit. Mm -hmm. If they'd be willing to confront some of the ugly things about themselves or the things that are making their relationship um, break down. If they were willing to like uh, confront their inner shadow, you know, like mm -hmm. really face the things that they're bringing to the table that are causing their partner pain or discomfort. And they were, if they could face that and tackle it head on and say, I could, I could do a little bit better. And even though it might cause me some discomfort and pain to grow in this area and to confront the fact that maybe I've been hurting my partner without even realizing it for years, even if I face this and own it, it will transform our, our relationship and our life, or I can just perpetuate it. And most people are just more comfortable perpetuating a negative habit that they've grown accustomed to than being willing to dig deep and, f and face the discomfort of evolving themselves and growing a little bit. And man, if you're willing to face those, those ugly things, I think that's true love right there is um, being willing to go through that discomfort in, in order to bring joy and pe mm -hmm. peace and happiness to your partner. Exactly. I mean, all it really is, is you love the other person. You really just want to make them happy. So really just going back to your point, if you want to make somebody happy, wouldn't you want to be a reflection of that person? Wouldn't you want to better yourself just a bit more? Wouldn't you want to just change some of the bad habits that you have to help that person or just to make them a little bit more happy? Because that's all really we want to do in relationships. We love the other person because we care about them. And if we care about them, it's the small things that help cultivate that relationship and make both people have that increased or strengthened bond together ultimately yeah. wow yeah i love that so good summary <laughs> exactly thank you um so before we kind of close the podcast i always like i've mentioned to my other guests i always like to ask a list of a few questions and i have for you today seven questions which is two more than my usual five that i <laughs> ask most and we'll just get started i mean answer it to the best of your ability yeah um there's no right or wrong answer to these so first question is what has been your least favorite and your favorite parts of interviewing people across the u.s mm. um my most favorite was just the the connections and, and the people that i met along the way and the realization that my love could or my relationship could look completely different than anybody else's and that's actually something to celebrate um that's probably the best part the the worst part is um probably the hours and hours and hours spent <laughs> just sitting in the car behind the steering wheel what would just to add a, a second question onto that but what was your go-to food while driving across the US. Dude, I love a good burger or some barbecue. Nice. Yeah. 
What are your personal thoughts on how technology and social media have changed the dynamic of relationships? Uh, it's tempting to say that it's all bad, but I don't think it is. I think there's some really cool, um, some really cool apps and, and technologies out there that actually help couples stay together. Like if you look at military couples, having something like zoom or Skype, um, helps them stay connected when, you know, in the past, all they would have is letters. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. There's really cool apps. Um, like there's one called get your marriage on. That's really cool. That helps couples stay connected. Uh, there's the Gottman card decks app, which has hundreds and hundreds of open-ended questions that can help you strengthen your, I know you pillar and that pillar of the, in that foundation of friendship. Um, so there's a lot of really cool things out there. I also think, uh, technology has, um, I mean, we've talked a lot about it already, but one of the one of the challenges that is presented is just the paradox of choice, where the the more choices that you have, the less sure you are that the choice that you've made is the right one. Mm -hmm. And I think that that can play a really negative role in trying to find your partner. Um, it's it's easier to order at uh, In and Out Burger than it is to order at Cheesecake Factory, because <laughs> there's just you know like when you when you have a, a, a book worth of dishes to choose from right it's hard to decide um but when you walk into in and out and you know that you're getting a burger you're just going to be happy with your burger man like that's it's exciting so i think paradox of choice can be um a really difficult thing if you're in a dating situation and mm -hmm. and you can compare every person that you go on with every other person that is single within a 20 mile radius of you mm -hmm. you point out that in your biography too many people spend all their time being insight chasers and few take on the uncomfortable task of being action takers. Yeah. What steps can people take to be action takers? Yeah. So a great step is if you heard something that resonated with you in this relationship, go implement it the moment that the, the interview is over. The, the people who get results have the shortest gap between when they learn something and when they put it into practice, it's one of the, uh, one of the, it's really great that learning things um, triggers the reward systems in our brain. Like we get that dopamine hit when you learn, like when you learn a new sex position or a new conversation uh, tactic, when you learn like something, some new snippet of information that's going to improve your life. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh yeah, I'm a better person now, <laughs> but you're not a better person. You're only a better person when you put that into practice. So spend less time, um, like just constantly reading self-help books and listening to podcasts and spend a little bit more time putting them into practice. Mm -hmm. Over the course of your journey, what has been the most important personal takeaway? It might be that being an action taker, <laughs> not an insight chaser. Cause one of the biggest problems that I ran into after doing this research for a really long time is I knew a lot of it, but I wasn't doing it because doing mm. it is hard and uncomfortable. Right. And the moment that I started doing the things that I knew were good for me is the moment that I actually started to see the results that I wanted in life. Are there any books or material that you would recommend people check out to better their relationships? Uh, yeah, a really great book is The Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work. That's all research-based. Um, another really great one is The New Rules of Marriage by Terry Reel. Uh, it's one of my favorite marriage books and he just does a really great job at debunking a lot of marriage myths and, um, helping people create really great agreements that will help them, um, have a functional, enjoyable marriage. If you could share a message with the listeners out there, what would you say? Mm. That when you do love, right, it's the most extraordinary thing in the world and doing love, right. is something that you can learn. It's not just for the lucky few who just find the right person. So if you really want to have a fulfilling life, it comes from having fulfilling relationships and having a f fulfilling relationship is something that you can learn and something that you can do. And the last question is, what is the most important thing people should know about you and what you do? My mission is to rid the world of mediocre love. And if there's ever anything that I can do to help you get closer to that goal, I would love if you would reach out because that that is what I wake up thinking about every single day. And if I can have an impact on you, it means I'm having an impact in the uh, having an impact in the world, and um, that's what I'm all about. I absolutely love that answer, Nate.
And on that note, for those who are interested in learning more about you and the work you do, and correct me if I'm wrong on these because there's a lot of resources I found <laughs> on you, um, they can find you on Twitter at Loveumentary as well as Instagram at Growth Marriage. And you also have a few websites, uh, loveumentary.com as well as growthmarriage.com. Do correct me if I'm wrong if there are other resources. Yeah, so... Cool. So Love You Mentory was the original name of my podcast, and then I changed it to Growth Marriage, and I just need to change all of my handles and stuff. So if you want to find the most current and active stuff, just go visit um, Growth Marriage. And then uh, specifically, if you are, if I can shamelessly plug something, go for it, yeah. um, com coming up here in a couple of weeks, uh, I'm doing something called the Epic Wives Experiment. And it is a series of one month's worth of experiments designed to help women get more um, connection and support and playfulness and fun and flirtation in their relationship than they've ever had before. So if they're feeling stuck, overwhelmed, burned out, stressed, um, a little down from quarantine, this is a, we've had over 500 women do it and the results have been ridiculously awesome. So if you just go to epicwivesexperiment.com, you can sign up and I think we're kicking off in about three in mid May. Um, so if, if this goes up before then we'd love to have you. And if you miss it, um, we'll be doing another round soon. Awesome, Nate. And I absolutely love the work you do. I'm incredibly impressed, and I'm sure that many out there appreciate what it is you do to help their relationships grow. And honestly, keep up the good work. Ladies and gentlemen, that will do it for this episode. Nate, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for the interview. It was great. Thank you all for tuning into this episode of the show with my guest, Nate Bagley, and I hope you all enjoyed it. Over the course of the conversation, Nate shared some incredible insights on the dynamics of relationships, dating, marriage, and partnerships for that matter. For those interested in learning more about Nate or taking part in the Epic Wives Experiment, I'll be dropping some links in the description of the episode. If you enjoyed this episode or even the show, I would love to hear from listeners and encourage you to drop a comment or feedback. For more episodes or to get updates on new episodes of the show, you can follow me on Twitter at Tesher Cohen or subscribe to the podcast on most podcast platforms. So thanks again for listening and stay tuned for more episodes of the All Things Interesting Podcast.